The next stage in human evolution has been decided and is going ahead as we speak. In the words of neuroscientist Amy Cruz, who said, We haven't had an upgrade in the human brain for, for quite some time. We haven't had an upgrade in the human brain for, for quite some time. And the problem is not just that we haven't had an upgrade in the human brain for quite some time, but we actually normally rely on technology to give us that upgrade or that edge. And so I think we're in this spot now where technology is not just sort of enhancing us, but it's actually kind of like kicking our butts, right? And so we need to actually do some things that will allow us to sort of upgrade the wetware at the same time as we're, you know, sort of incorporating all these new technology pieces. Amy Cruz is convinced that we need an upgrade. And she is delusional to think that we have had an upgrade in some distant Darwinian past. These are very scary words Amy is using. To achieve this, they are going to require a host of invasive surgeries as well as genetic modifications, which could result in a completely new species of humans. The company in question responsible for these upgrades is called Neuralink, created by Elon Musk. Here's what he has to say about it. Um, so I want to emphasize the, the purpose of Neuralink. Like, uh, what do we, what's our goal? Our goal is to solve important spine and brain problems with a seamlessly, seamlessly implant, implanted device. So you want to have a device that you can basically uh, put in your head um, and feel and look totally normal, uh, but it solves uh, some, some important problem um, in your brain or spine. Elon Musk is selling us on the idea that it is to solve brain and spine problems. But as I'll show you in this video, there is far more to it than that. In a lot of ways, it's kind of like a Fitbit in your skull with tiny wires. Our, our current prototype, version 0.9, has about a thousand channels. Uh, so that's you know, about a hundred times better than the, the next best um, uh, consumer device that's available. And it's a 23 millimeters by 8 millimeters. It actually uh, fits quite nicely in your skull because your, your skull is about 10 millimeters thick. So uh, it fits, it's, it goes flush with your skull, it's invisible, and all you can see afterwards is that there's a tiny scar. And if it's under your hair, you can't see it at all. In fact, I could have a neural link right now and you wouldn't know. All right, so it's also inductively charged. So um, it's charged in the same way that you charge you charge a smartwatch or a phone, um, and so you can use it all day, uh, charge it at night, and have full functionality. Uh, in terms of getting a link, so that, um, we, you need to have the device, uh, a great device, and you also need to have a great robot that uh, puts in the, uh, the electrodes and uh, does the surgery. So you want the surgery to be as, as automated uh, and, and as possible, and the only way you can achieve the level of precision that's needed is with an advanced robot. Uh, the link procedure, the, the installation of a link, done in under an hour. Um, so you can basically go in in the morning and leave the hospital in the afternoon. And it can be done without general anesthesia. So how are they going to upgrade our wetware, meaning our brains? So this, this shows you um, a sort of close-up view, uh, which I think is actually not too gruesome, uh, of the electrodes being inserted in the brain. And if you look closely, you'll see that um, it's, a, it's a little counterintuitive that uh, if the electrodes are inserted very carefully, that there is no bleeding. Um, and so the, uh, if you have very tiny electrodes and if they're inserted very carefully, so that the robot actually images the brain and makes sure to avoid any veins or arteries so that the electrodes can be inserted um, with no noticeable damage. So you will have no noticeable uh, neural damage. Uh, in inserting the link. Uh, another question from Twitter. Will you be able to save and replay memories in the future? Uh, yes, I think uh, in the future you will be able to save and re replay memories. Um, I mean, this is obviously sounding increasingly like a Black Mirror episode. Um, but, uh, <laughs> well, I guess they're pretty good at predicting. Um, but yeah, essentially, if, if you have a whole brain interface, everything that's encoded in memory, you could uh, you could upload, you could basically store your memories um, as a backup and restore the memories. Um, and ultimately, you could potentially download them into a new body or into a robot body. The future is going to be weird. Yes, the future is going to be weird, 
because people like Elon Musk, Bill Gates and Amy Cruz are designing this future to be weird. Watch the movies The Island, Sixth Day with Arnold Schwarzenegger and some Black Mirror episodes to see the kind of future these mega rich geniuses desire. So just what are they planning to do? Let's get a deeper explanation of what their agenda is. I'm talking about merging brains with technology. I'm talking about merging brains with technology. Merging brains with technology? We think we've lost rights and control of our lives now. If we accept this, it will be the end of our independence and privacy. Listen to how excited Amy Cruz gets by the prospect of merging our brains with computers, in a sense becoming Wi-Fi connected and one with the Google brain. Where I'm talking about merging brains with technology. I think there's a huge opportunity to upgrade our brains using technology, like the things I've talked about, neuroplasticity and other types of interventions, and I'm happy to talk about those. But today I really want to talk about this sort of enhanced human cognition through this merger. We have a concept at the Platypus Institute called Human 2.0. Um, and when we, we talk about Human 2.0, what we mean is right, this really broad picture of all the fantastic things that we can do to ourselves to, uh, to really kind of upgrade our experience, right? And so the, you know, the things that we want to be, right, are we want to be adaptable and creative, we want to have increased memory, we want to think you know, intuitively, we want increased processing capacity. These are all things that I believe right now we can actually work on in our human experience experience through, through neuroscience. On the other side of the page is actually what I'll call the emerging capabilities, which is like really cool stuff, right? Like, you know, giving ourselves sensory enhancement through maybe the implantation or, or, or other types of sensory devices, brains being networked to one another, whether that's through the you know, sort of Internet of Things or actually Internet, you know, connected to one another, or actually, you know, the, the sort of some of the work that you've seen actually recently in, in, um, in the popular literature on increasing memory through both the stimulation of memory systems as well as the uploading and downloading of memories. So the PowerPoint slide behind Amy Cruz, which was quite blurry, is worthwhile looking at. Here are the enhancement lists or the really cool stuff, as Amy put it, that they promised those of us who would qualify to receive this Human 2.0 upgrade. Darwinism is dead for sapiens. We not only won that game, we ended that game for our species. Medical technology going forward has enabled the tools for us for the first time to give the species a power to influence the direction of its own evolution. So the future of medical technology innovation is going to be less about innovating things that help us live longer, better lives. And it's going to be more about innovating ourselves. Welcome to self-directed evolution. Now, is that really possible? Yes, it is starting to happen now. So how much of me can I replace or modify or change out before I'm not one of us anymore? Not a real person. 3D printed organs? Maybe some robotic components that respond to my thoughts. Maybe a memory card upgrade for my brain. Okay, the last one is still a stretch, but the first two are actually already here. And everyone knows our genes influence us profoundly, right? But they're not the whole story by a long shot. Picture your genome as a piano and my genome as a guitar and somebody plays happy birthday on both instruments. We would recognize the song in both cases. We would also recognize they're being played on different instruments, different genomes. Now picture someone sitting at that same piano playing happy birthday and then changing the sheet music to play a Mozart symphony. Same instrument, same genome, very different results. 
That analogy illustrates something called epigenetics. Epigenetics is the sheet music that gets played on your genetic piano. Epigenetics regulates your genes. It turns them on and off. It turns the amount of protein they make up or down. It influences how those proteins get modified. So for example, if you could wake up the right dormant genes on me, maybe I could grow back our long lost tail. Would that make me less of a real person? But let's not stop at turning our genes on and off or up and down. Why settle for swapping out the sheet music when I can turn my piano into a guitar? Many of you have probably heard of gene editing or genetic engineering, the process of deliberately making changes to our genes. Historically, that has been a pretty dicey proposal. It took highly sophisticated, expensive equipment, highly trained personnel, and even then, it was a roll of the dice. Very, very difficult to do precisely and to assure good outcomes. But lately, a new tool called CRISPR has arrived. CRISPR has made gene editing so easy and so precise that with some high-end equipment, you could practically do it in your kitchen. And this is not some Orwellian future threat. CRISPR-edited babies have already been created and born. And the tools just keep getting better and easier. So how far do we go with these tools until the result isn't a real person anymore? Let's listen to what he just said again. So how far do we go with these tools until the result isn't a real person anymore? The answer is not very far at all. Change the genes and you change the species. This is why it's called self-directed evolution. The theory of evolution teaches that small changes in genetic makeup creates new species. It's called speciation. Speciation is an evolutionary process by which a new species comes into being. Speciation can be driven by evolution, which is a process that results in the accumulation of many small genetic changes called mutations in a population over a long period of time. What CRISPR and the Human 2.0 advocates are proposing is to make these genetic modifications occur within a short period of time, say within an afternoon surgery. Walk into the surgery a human, walk out as some kind of mutant human, never to be truly human again. Genetic engineering holds great promise for the future of humanity. A growing number of scientists believe that we will soon be able to engineer and change our genes in a way that will help us live longer and healthier lives. David Sinclair is a geneticist at Harvard Medical School. He believes it's possible to unlock the fountain of youth, but how much should we really tinker with our own nature? Nothing about our lives is natural. Maybe the oxygen we're breathing is natural, but everything else is unnatural. It's human-made, it's man-made, and we change our environment. And tackling diseases and tackling aging is also natural. That's what we do as humans. We don't accept misery and frailty as natural ways of life. We should not be doing that for any disease, and we should not be doing it for old age either. Now they are telling us that nothing about our lives is natural. When the truth is we are completely natural, the only thing that is not natural is the world in which we are subjected to. If we go in the direction these guys want to go, then after we are genetically modified, they can say that nothing in our lives is natural. Biotechnology is bringing about another age of humanity. Well, there are two types of information in our bodies that are essential for life. One is genetic and the other is epigenetic. Epigenetic is the term for any process and structure that governs the way the genetic information is packaged and read by the cell. All of our cells, essentially all of our cells, have the same genome. But what distinguishes a brain cell from a liver cell and what allows an, a fertilized egg to become a 26 billion composite of different cell types when it's born is the epigenome. And the epigenome, I believe, is the reason that we age. A nerve cell in an older person is no longer fully a nerve cell. It's starting to move around in so-called Waddington landscape space or epigenomic space, and it's becoming a different type of cell. 
a nerve cell in an old person may be partly a skin cell. I mean, think about that. No wonder we start to lose the function of our retina. No wonder we start to forget things if our cells don't maintain their epigenomic information. Question is though, can we slow this down? And can we reset the system? Is there a reboot? Is there a backup hard drive of this early setup that we can access and restore that structure? I believe that it's possible. In the last few years, we've seen the development of new gene editing technologies that were much quicker and easier than ever before. New discoveries in gene editing technologies are popping up everywhere in the world, and experts predict that we will see many more in the coming years. Many scientists believe that genetic engineering is the future of our evolution. It provides us with a chance to give ourselves any traits we want, such as muscle mass or eye color. Basically, anything is possible. Jennifer Doudna is a biochemist known for her pioneering work in CRISPR gene editing, for which she was awarded the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. She believes that the technical obstacles to gene editing have been overcome and that the world is now rapidly approaching the day when it will be possible to make essentially any kind of change to any kind of genome. Every living thing that we know of on our planet has a nucleic acid that encodes the genetic information and, and for cells that's, that's DNA. This is a, a technology that is enabling in many different areas of biology. Scientists are using gene editing to alter the DNA of animals like pigs that are envisioned to be good organ donors for humans and using it in two ways. One is to remove endogenous viruses from the pig DNA that could otherwise potentially infect humans that received organs donated by these animals. And the other is to make the organs in these animals more human-like so they're less likely to induce an immune reaction. And that's actually work that's going on both in academic labs and also in uh, companies now. This work is moving forward quite quickly, and I think that most people would agree that this is a, an exciting potential application of this that could solve a real problem, which is the scarcity of organs that are necessary for donations. Athletic performance will also be affected heavily in the future. We will be able to modify genes that lead to better performance or make it easier for different sports to be performed. This could be done through gene doping, Instead of injecting DNA into a person's body for the purpose of restoring some function related to a damaged or missing gene, as in a gene therapy, gene doping involves inserting DNA for the purpose of enhancing athletic performance. Decades-long research in mice suggests that in the future, despite the potential risks, this technology could be used in humans. It would make us faster, our muscles stronger, and even improve reaction time. Mikey, I think he likes it. How about some more? Hell yes. Hell yeah. How was he? Ten hours straight. He's so ashamed. Show me. Ultimately, the rise of gene therapy suggests the possibility of improvement in mental characteristics such as memory or intelligence. Although these discoveries are encouraging, Sinclair cautions that people set their expectations realistically. There are many ethical concerns that have been raised about human genetic engineering, but this hasn't deterred many scientists and engineers from developing new gene editing technologies. Dr. George Church is a professor of health sciences and technology at Harvard and MIT. He believes that almost everything will be better because of genetics. So the projects that, that I find most compelling and exciting in terms of applications are transplantation of organs. There's a, a gigantic uh, need for that. Gene drives to eliminate malaria and then for developing nations and then 
aging reversal for industrialized nations where most of the morbidity and mortality is due to diseases of aging. You want to get at the core of that. And then once you have all those things, which are drains on our economy, if you can solve all those, then you can reduce, you have more money available for things like uh, space, where we really need to get off the planet to avoid super volcanoes and asteroids. And that has a genetic component as well. As genetic engineering technology approaches an unprecedented era of human gene editing, the ethical implications are beginning to arise on how to balance our desire for longevity and enhancements with our fears over the misuse of this technology. What is the moral responsibility of scientists and humans towards future generations? Is this an opportunity for human progress or a looming disaster in the making? We are beginning to reach the point where we can no longer ignore these questions. With technological advances in molecular biology like CRISPR that allow for specific gene editing approaches, many scientists argue that there are strong potential risks to human genetic engineering. I would hope that initial uses are limited to real medical need rather than what we might consider to be enhancements. I think that we need to be thoughtful about putting in place appropriate guidelines and, and frankly I would say regulations that really establish a set of principles that there's some price to be paid if you cross that line and, and the challenge is always how to do that and of course science is global now. It's very hard to imagine quite how we would regulate or, or maybe enforce regulations globally but I think we have to be just very uh, thoughtful thinking about how we can put in place a set of very clear requirements that might turn into regulations ultimately. Gene therapies have advanced in recent years, but are still in a gray area of regulations. As with any new technology, scientists are cautious. Once we start tampering with our genetic code, who's to say what else we could do with it? And if we can genetically modify humans for the better, should we hold back due to moral concerns? The ethical dilemmas that arise as we are forced to contemplate such possibilities threaten the foundation of science and medicine. To date, gene therapy has only been used in a very limited number of patients who face a very limited period of time or likelihood of survival. We need to be careful with human genetic enhancement as there is a risk of random edits that could have permanent consequences. We still don't know about the interactions with other genes that could cause harmful reactions. Enhancing human characteristics and capacities through the use of reproductive technology and human genetic engineering is a topic of ongoing scientific study, controversy, and moral debate. There are many different consequences and ethical implications of human enhancement and genetic modification. Some ethical concerns about this possibility include unequal access to genetic enhancement or even a widening gap between genetically enhanced individuals and normal ones. The prospect of gene modification is a double-edged sword with numerous dangers lurking around every corner. No one can predict all the challenges we face in the future in making genetic engineering safe and secure, but there is no question that the development of genetic engineering will profoundly affect the future of humanity. And I'm only talking about the changes that get done on purpose. What about the mistakes? or as CRISPR users euphemistically call them, the off-target effects. Now, the fact that these tools are already in use shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. One thing we know about sapiens is if we can do something, we tend to do it, and we'll deal with the consequences later. So how's all this going to turn out? Yeah. Maybe you should ask your dog. Darwinism ended for them the day we took control of their breeding. And we've demonstrated our ability to get pretty creative with a complex mammal using only the tool, crude tool, of selective breeding. With the massively more powerful tools of medical technology at our disposal, make no mistake about it, Sapiens is rapidly approaching a major fork in its evolutionary road. That makes this possibly one of the most exciting or scariest times in human history. Of course, there are the promises of health and longevity, as Andrew Cothrell will list, but in the hands of a tyrant dictator or of some spoilt billionaire with no concern for anyone but themselves, what are the possible implications of receiving this technology? 
What we are heading towards is a very unsafe world to be plugging ourselves into in the manner described here. To determine how to use the tools of self-directed evolution in a way that benefits, think of the possibilities with these tools. No more cancer. No more Alzheimer's. No more diabetes. And as long as we're getting rid of diabetes, let's wipe out obesity. But is being fat a defect that needs to be cured? Ah, well, for sure, let's get rid of addiction. And if along the way there's an off-target effect that maybe makes us more accepting of authority or more compliant, eh, there's a price to be paid for everything. Did you hear that? Listen carefully to his words. And if along the way there's an off-target effect that maybe makes us more accepting of authority or more compliant, eh, there's a price to be paid for everything. A price to be paid for everything? We shouldn't have to pay a price for something that world leaders and billionaires and scientific leaders want. Basically what they are saying is that if we plug into this system using this technology, we will become robots totally compliant to the will of the elite. This is the ultimate for world leaders, to have a population totally subservient to their will and agenda. And let's get rid of arthritis, please. And as long as we're getting rid of arthritis, let's throw in some extra speed, a little extra strength. But how much? Let's add some extra years. But how many? And if we're adding years, we're going to increase population. We should stop making tall people. They're resource hogs. They eat more food. They drive bigger cars. They need bigger houses. It would be for the greater good, right? Welcome to the slippery slope, folks. And don't be fooled if this ethical and moral slope seems shallow at first. Take a few steps on the surface of self-directed evolution and the steep drop-off will take your breath away. Master race of blue-eyed blondes, anyone? So how will we know when we've gone too far? Will we just know it when we see it? Sure, it seems easy when I show you pictures of these guys, right? It seems very obvious and very far in the future. But it might be coming faster than you might think or want. Some of you might remember from the 2012 Olympics, this guy, Oscar Pistorius. A huge controversy raised at the time as to whether he should be allowed to participate in the games because of the unfair advantage his high-tech legs gave him. Well, with this next wave of modifications and improvements coming, where will the next shoe drop? Will it be college or pro sports? Maybe it'll be questions I'm allowed to ask in a job interview or in an insurance application. And how will finances figure into all this? If only the very wealthy can afford a procedure like splicing in a few extra IQ points, the gap we have today between haves and have-nots will seem like child's play in a generation or two. It will be more than a gap between the haves and have-nots. It will be only those who have ascended to 2.0 who will survive. Those who refuse an upgrade will be unfit for society. According to Darwinian evolution, only the fittest survive. As our dogs so aptly demonstrate, you underestimate sapiens' capacity for creativity and for mischief at your own hazard. To decide how to use the tools of self-directed evolution equitably and fairly. To decide whether we stay together as a single species or return to a multi-hominin world. To answer questions like this well will require a level of civic engagement previously reserved for world wars. The alternative is it might cause wars, but this time it'll be the modified versus the unmodified. I don't want that. I want a world where all of humanity evolves its way to lives worthy of celebration, where we collectively become humans 2.0. This guy wants to have the cake and to eat it too. 
You can't know the history of mankind and man's inherent desire for power and control and think that this kind of technology and control of humans would be ultimately used for good and not evil. You can't have this utopian dream and upgrade the human race artificially at the same time. This man and others like him are delusional and reveal it in their presentations. Life on planet Earth is truly becoming a Black Mirror episode. I don't want to live in H.G. Wells' world of Morlocks and Eloy. So we're the first species on this planet with both the privilege and the burden of having the opportunity to influence our own evolution. What are we, what are you going to do with that? Are we going to allow the developers, the practitioners, the regulators of medical technology to determine our future as a species? Guys in white lab coats have done some really horrible things over the years. And while the science is not going to slow down, we have some time. And so you are now called to use that time to get educated so that you can make responsible, informed choices. What will your role be in all of this? Active or passive? Spectator or participant? Because this train is leaving the station. You can decide to get on board. You can decide to watch it go. You might try to stop it or change its destination. But be prepared to make wise decisions. We all want to leave a better world for our great-grandchildren. But now we must consider what our great-grandchildren will be. Thanks. Between running the show at Tesla and sending his SpaceX rockets into outer space, it's surprising that Elon Musk still has time for his many ambitious side hustles. His latest bit on the side, Neuralink, has flown under the radar for the past few years. But it's now captivating the world's attention for a reason that's as intriguing as it is scary. Musk suggests that Neuralink will facilitate his mission to merge humans with artificial intelligence and subsequently save the human race from AI. Most of Musk's businesses run off the backbone of forward-thinking technology, but one piece of tech that Musk openly fears is AI. He firmly believes that artificial intelligence is the biggest threat to the human race, and that advancements in its technology is a dangerous game for us all to be playing. This seems like an oxymoron. If AI is the biggest threat to the human race, Musk doesn't suggest back off on the development of AI. He suggests that we merge with it. Does anyone else see the issue with this? It sounds a little far-fetched to think that AI could literally wipe out life as we know it, but Musk isn't alone in his worries. In its current narrow form, AI can already outperform humans at literally any mental task, from solving equations to playing chess. But if we were to unleash its full potential and develop AI into a wide form of intelligence, it could and would outperform humans in every way imaginable, especially if we partner it up with robotics. Musk sees only one way of escaping the impending doom of an AI-facilitated human extinction, and that is to somehow merge our own intelligence with machine intelligence. Without realising, we are all already somewhat merged with machine intelligence by merely owning a smartphone and having access to the internet. With the World Wide Web at our fingertips, we are countless times smarter than without. The only limitation that we have is speed. Searching for information using the internet is slow in the way that we have to find, read and process before we can relay any information back out. All of this takes time. The goal of Neuralink is to make this connection between man and machine seamless. And the best way to do that is to physically merge the two together using a microchip brain implant. So what exactly is this first-gen brain implant? Dubbed the N1, the very first Neuralink implant is a tiny 4 by 4 mm square chip that will be directly implanted into the brain. Attached to the chip are tiny wires that are 10 times thinner than a human hair, which coincidentally is about the same thickness as a neuron. The threads are embedded into essential parts of the brain, where they can decipher messages that are transmitted between neurons. The threads then relay that information back to the chip, where it records the impulses, evaluates the data, and then stimulates its own responses. The chip and wires not only read the information that the brain communicates, but also inputs information back into the brain as well. 
A single Neuralink chip will be able to connect and communicate with 1,000 different brain cells, and an individual will be able to house as many as 10 implants, totaling 10,000 connections. You'd think that the installation of such a device would be really complicated, dangerous and invasive. But Musk has been very clear that the installation of Neuralink chips will be as straightforward as laser eye surgery. Neuralink are putting as much effort into the design and development of their robotic surgical device as the chips and wires themselves. Musk says that it will be able to undertake the procedure more intelligently and accurately than any human could, so it's the obvious route to go down. I'm sure Mr. Musk is over the moon that his tech can and most likely will help those with disabilities. But I think it's the more out there possibilities of merging humans with AI that really gets his juices flowing. In the distant or maybe not so distant future, Musk sees Neuralink's AI chips being installed along the same lines as plastic surgery. As in, it will be an optional surgery that some people get done, but it won't be absolutely mandatory. Although he also says that if everybody around you has the brain power of a quantum computer, then you will probably be tempted to get the procedure done yourself, especially if you plan on competing for jobs and keeping up with conversations. The possibilities of Neuralink's AI implants are endless, and that's not a figure of speech. AI's knowledge literally has no end point, because it's forever learning, working things out, and becoming better, all at a rate that we can't even comprehend. To paint a picture for you, with the help of Neuralink, you'll be able to do everything that your computer or smartphone can, but directly through thought. If you need to answer a question, your brain will just know it, because it has untapped access to the internet, just like how you currently have untapped access to your own knowledge. With Neuralink, you'll automatically know everything that you'd usually need to ask without even having to pop the question. Date, time, weather, geographical location, Brad Pitt's height in inches, anything. But Neuralink is not all about information. It's also about interaction and communication. Because the embedded AI can wirelessly transmit electrode signals, users will essentially be able to communicate with other computers and chip-wearing people with mind power alone. This communication will be almost instant, as it would have zero of the physical restraints that we currently have attached to speaking and typing. Think of it like pinging a thought into somebody else's Dropbox, but faster. Neuralink essentially turns you into a living, breathing Alexa that can control pretty much anything with an internet connection. Video games, drones, cars, all powered through thought. Musk's mission to merge humans with AI is a pretty crazy concept to wrap your head around, but the speed and direction that Neuralink is moving makes it one with genuine possibility. In the immediate future, the technology will most likely benefit the lives of countless people, but who knows how intelligent these chips will really get. I find it strange that Musk is fearful of a computer-based AI, but sees no problem with a human-based system. I can see hacking, bugs and weaponization being a genuine issue of having a population of cyborgs. But hopefully, with the help of AI, we will be smart enough to figure all that out at a later date. The first human testing of the full-spec N1 Neuralink chip is planned for the end of 2020, so it might not be long until we see this technology really taking shape. Strange days. I dare say that now that the whole world has been ravaged by COVID, that we do indeed live in strange days. Doomsday prophets are having a field day, QAnon conspiracies abound, and the average person is beside themselves with fear of what is coming upon the whole earth. If we add to the COVID pandemic the threats of war, the increase of natural disasters, the increase of many other diseases and sicknesses which are killing and debilitating the human race, the health epidemic, obesity epidemic, shady governments, falsehoods and lies, misinformation and disinformation that we continually receive daily through the media, the destruction of the family unit and just the general lack of empathy and love left in men. We have got to ask ourselves some deep and searching questions. Could this be the end? Has mankind run its course? Or even, are the prophecies of the ancient scriptures coming true in our days? This documentary and many others this ministry has and will produce is to help us see the bigger picture, far above what is fed us in the media or what conspiracy theorists use to fearmonger their followers. We intend to shine a light on today's events with a prophetical torch. Matthew 24, 37 to 39, Jesus says, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. 
that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. In this passage, Jesus parallels the days of the end with the days just before the great flood during the days of Noah. He writes us a brief history of that day by explaining that before the flood came and killed the entire inhabitants of the earth, bar Noah and his family, that life went on as usual. No one expected the end to be so close, even right at the door, and then suddenly it was upon them and none survived. This is how it will be at this time. People will continue to marry, party, eat at restaurants, sing and dance, conduct business, build homes, commit crimes, and then suddenly the end will come. There is more to what Jesus said about the days of Noah than his brief history lesson in Matthew 24. What was the inhabitants of the earth like during the days of Noah? What was going on? What other similes can we draw from the days of Noah to help us navigate this time? Genesis 6, 1-5, it says, When men began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal, his days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. When the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. So I have a few questions. How great is man's wickedness? Who were the sons of God? Who were the Nephilim? Who were the men of renown? During the days of Noah, we see that God saw that every inclination of the thoughts of men's heart was only evil all the time. Are we living in a day when the thoughts of many men's hearts are evil all the time? Jesus even said about the time of the end that because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. There is certainly an increase of wickedness of all kinds from world leaders all the way down to the average man or woman in the street. 2 Timothy 3, 1-5 says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. So who were the sons of God? Christian writers such as Justin Martyr, Eusebius, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, and Commodianus, in other words, the best of the earliest Christian writers and close to contemporaries of the original apostles, believe that the sons of God in Genesis 6, 1-4 were fallen angels who engaged in unnatural union with human women, resulting in the begetting of the Nephilim. Some scholars view Jesus' comments in Matthew 22:30 that angels in heaven do not marry as to refute this view. But a common belief is that because these sons of God married human women, that that was the sin that actually brought about their fall and caused them to become fallen angels. The sons of God is clearly a reference to the third of the angelic hosts that fell with Satan when he was cast out of heaven, as it says in Luke 10, 18. So who were the Nephilim? So according to Genesis, the Nephilim were the result of the sons of God, fallen angels, mating with human women who gave birth to them. Nephilim comes from the Hebrew word Nephilim, which means giants. So according to biblical history, there were giants on earth as a result of the fallen angels tampering with the DNA of humans through impregnation. Whether that was due to the angels themselves impregnating them, or the angels possessing human males who impregnated them, or the angels scientifically tampering with the women, whatever the case, they produced giant offspring. These Nephilim were men of renown. You could call them the celebrities of that day. You could also call them demigods, part human, part god. Looking at these scriptures in this way gives some credence to the gods and demigods of ancient mythology. As far as speculating on the type of tampering with human DNA that went on during the days of Noah, I will not go beyond what the Bible speaks of. But what we can say is that humans of that time were wicked beyond measure and much of the human race had its DNA corrupted. The reason I bring this up is because Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at his coming. The possibilities within the words of Jesus is that the human race will once more be corrupted by wickedness and even genetically changed and modified. We know that the whole world has become increasingly wicked, but whether this will result in a race of giants appearing on the scene and then becoming objects of worship, 
men of renown, I can't say. But what we should be concerned about is when we hear world-renowned scientists speaking of the need for humanity to have an evolutionary upgrade to human 2.0, desiring to alter the genetic makeup of humans and turn them into superhumans by using gene therapy. This makes for some very worrying times. When we consider that all of what is taking place in the world at the moment was spoken of accurately in biblical writings from over 2,000 years ago, we must consider then that the Bible is accurate and totally true and the world we live in is corrupt to the core. If the Bible is accurate and true, then everything it says about Jesus Christ is also accurate and true, which means that he died on a cross for your sin and corruption and is willing to forgive you of all your sins and accept you into everlasting life and save you when you pass on from this life. Place all your hope in him. All I can say is that there is no other name under heaven which will save us from death. Turn and place your hope in Jesus and he will guide and navigate you through these crazy times of which we are living in. And he will be with you to the very end.